Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and dear students. I would like to welcome you today for the first lecture in our public uh, lecture series, where we, and the language is English, and we are very much honored to have um, distinguished guests here. Our speakers are um, uh, with very international uh, background, as you will see, because it's typical for the United Nations. I think it has to be like this. So I'm, uh, they are sitting in Vienna in, within the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, but um, they will tell uh, stories, I think, that are of global character. So I uh, very much would like to welcome you, Victoria, and uh, you, Alex, on the talk that you give today, um, United Nations uh, Office on Drugs and Crime and NGOs, not always an easy collaboration. Um, we, have, we will proceed like this, that um, the first talk will be given by Victoria and Mr. White, and afterwards we'll have the Alex Petkov. Um, please do not interrupt during the uh, talks. Uh, you can of course use the chat all the time, also during, um, uh, during the speaking time, but um, uh, after each presentation, we will have explicitly the opportunity that we discuss your questions, uh, but and after the presentation of each of the speaker, you can also use your microphone and just uh, speak up. Uh, if there is enough time at the end, we can also uh, arrange uh, one general discussion as a final talk or as a final summary uh, of the two speakers for today. Uh, so one more time, thank you very much for joining us and for sharing with us your time, your precious knowledge, your experience. Um, and I would like, first of all, to um, present Victoria to you. Uh, she has been working for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime since 2015. She is a program officer at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime Civil Society team in Vienna. So you see, there is the point about the uh, nonprofit sector here. She manages anti-corruption projects that stretch across Africa, Southeast Europe, and Central Asia. The work she does contributes to the implementation of the United Nations Convention, Convention Against Corruption, the only legally binding universal anti-corruption instrument, and bringing the many voices of NGOs to the international debate and increasing their dialogue with member states. She works across different areas of the program cycle, from project development to monitoring and evaluation. The projects she works on have taken her to different parts of the world and countries such as Senegal, Ethiopia, Turkmenistan, Serbia, to name a few. Originally from Lit Lithuania, Victoria has an MA in International Relations and French from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. She also spent a year studying in Reunion Island she speaks English, Russian, and French. Besides her direct work, she mentors students at the Regional Academy of the United Nations, and she has supported a few other academic initiatives along the way. And I just have to also, in, uh, you know, to emphasize the fact that the both speakers, uh, uh, they belong to the, to the youngest uh, uh, staff within the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. So it's, um, I think, quite a promising, uh, uh, quite a promising uh, in, uh, in terms also of future cooperation and, of course, uh, young open mind setting. So, um, Victoria, uh, the stage is yours, please. Thank you, Milena, for, um, for the introduction and uh, good evening from Vienna to all of you listening in. As I was saying to Milena, we in Vienna are under a soft lockdown, so uh, most of the work we do is being done um, from home in an online format, um, which I gather is also the case for the, for the academic world across Europe. Um, I hope that all of you are keeping healthy and, uh, and doing well and that um, you are enjoying the university life these days. I guess it's not the same. Um, and uh, that you're keeping connected with your peers, that the learning environment you are in is, is encouraging and it is stimulating your curiosity, despite the, this uh, lack and, and absence of face-to-face um, -face interactions. Now, uh, there are a few things I certainly don't miss from my university life uh, and doing all the reference is one of them. 
and uh, and uh, also I think I, I give up on on trying to read everything they would give me on the reading list in my first year of university. But on a more serious note, um, today I'm very pleased uh, to be part of this uh, lecture, and. Uh, with my colleague Alex, we'll try to shed some light on how we at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime uh, work with civil society organizations. I don't have a PowerPoint for you, but I will kindly ask Milena to share with you a one page document, which will recap the key information that I will, I'll talk you through and uh, some web links that you can use for your future research. Now, uh, everyone I'm certain knows the United Nations, but I'm guessing very few of you have heard of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime or UNODC. So allow me first um, to take you through the mandates of our office so you understand a bit better the, the nature of the work we do. So UNODC is part of the UN Secretariat which is one of the six major organs of the United Nations. Our office was established some two decades ago in um, 1997. And uh, its work is based around five normative areas. And these are um, strengthening member states' uh, capacities to address transnational organized crime, terrorism, corruption, then um, strengthening um, uh, criminal justice systems and uh, uh, supporting governments in implementing a, a balanced and evidence-based approach to the world drug issue. The work of UNODC is guided by a broad range of international legally binding instruments. Milena already mentioned one. Uh, such as the UN Convention Against Corruption or uh, the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. So here our office really helps governments to ratify and implement those legal instruments. And we work to enhance uh, dialogue, cooperation uh, around, the, around the five normative areas, including with civil society. Uh, on the ground, um, UNODC um, supports uh, institutions to function effectively uh, so that, for example, their staff is equipped with the required skills or, or, or that the, the right uh, uh, internal frameworks are in place, such as codes of conduct. UNODC is also active in data collection, research and analysis, and that's where civil society um, also comes into play, you may have heard of our flagship publication, which is called the World Drug Report. Now it's a big office, it operates in 80 countries around the world uh, with uh, through, through 115 field offices and um, some 2400 personnel working globally. And um, Milena mentioned Alex and myself, we are based in Vienna. So Vienna um, is one of the four headquarters of the United Nations, along with Geneva, New York, and Nairobi. So the angle we are presenting is really uh, that of how we are engaging with civil society from headquarters perspective. A task which is uh, very interesting, very exciting, but can also be very bureaucratic. And uh, I'm alluding that it is, um, very procedural and, and, and very official, it's because uh, it's the member states, the governments that uh, have the keys to the door. So they are, they're the ones that provide the funding. And at the end of the day, they are the ones that decide who will be part of that platform where they meet to discuss the issues on drugs and crime. Now, having said that, over the past um, 10 years, we've been seeing really a, a gradual increase in uh, funding devoted for civil society engagement. So this is a sign that uh, dialogue and cooperation with civil society are becoming uh, more and more important and that governments are finding it more and more difficult to do their work without civil society. 
Now, um, I'm sure many professors have talked to you about what is civil society, right? Uh, but uh, let me uh, just touch upon the definitions that we uh, at, at UNODC, that we use in our line of work. So whilst term NGO refers more narrowly to uh, nonprofit organizations that advocate and provide services in the areas of economic and social development, welfare and emergency relief, civil society encompasses uh, wider capacities. And uh, um, the UN refers to civil society as the third sector along with uh, governments and uh, private businesses. And here um, in our programming language, we normally use the definition of the World Bank, which says that um, CSOs represent a wide array of formal and informal organizations, such as community groups, um, NGOs, labor unions, um, indigenous groups, uh, to name a few. So, you may know that NGOs have been partners of the United Nations since uh, late um, 1940s. So there is really a plethora of NGOs out there and it would be very hard, nearly impossible to interact with each and every one. So there are clear processes concerning NGO engagement with the United Nations and specifically our office, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. So in accordance with Article 7.1 of the UN Charter, NGOs have, can have a consultative status with the Economic and Social Council. And this status provides NGOs access to the ECOSOC, to its subsidiary bodies, to the various human rights mechanism of the United Nations, to certain meetings of the president of the General Assembly, among other important gatherings. In addition to this, um, the rules um, of procedure of specific intergovernmental meetings allow for participation of other relevant NGOs. So NGOs that don't have the ECOSOC status, but they have very clear defined parameters. And UNODC is one of these entities that interacts both with ECOSOC and non-ECOSOC, as we see other relevant NGOs that work on the mandates of our office, namely pertaining to tackling uh, crime and addressing the world drug issue. NGOs engage um, with our office through two Vienna-based commissions and two conventions. These co commissions, they are our governing bodies. The first is the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. So as the name implies, it's the main policy making body that looks into crime prevention and criminal justice. And then the second is the Commission on Narcotic Drugs which is supervising the application of the international drug control treaties. As for the conventions, you heard me referring to them. We have the, the conference of the state parties to the UN convention against corruption. And the other one, we have the conference of the parties to the UN convention against transnational organized crime. So these events provide opportunities for, for NGOs, for civil society organizations more broadly, to submit their opinions in the form of written statements, to make statements during plenary sessions, to engage with their and other governments when uh, um, discussions and negotiations on certain resolutions and items are taking place. Um, they can also importantly um, conduct, uh, organize uh, side events. And these uh, side events can be organized exclusively by NGOs or uh, alongside uh, with a member state or UNODC. So obviously these events are the opportunities uh, for the NGOs to state their opinions, uh, to bring their voice to the international debate, to showcase their work, to showcase their areas of interest. And uh, furthermore, um, NGOs serve as very important partners for UNODC at the operational level. And here I'm referring to our uh, global, regional and country level programs and projects. Uh, 
you'll hear more about um, one of, of these initiatives from my uh, colleague, Alex. Um, whether um, we're talking about um, one of these conferences, such as Conference of the State Parties to the UN Convention Against Corruption, um, or CSO participation in subsidiary bodies, the entry point and, and liaison for civil society organizations is the UNODC civil society team, which I, I, I myself work for. So it, it serves as a bridge between NGOs on one side and UNODC member states and other actors on the other side. And uh, what uh, we mainly do is that we facilitate civil society participation in the, the aforementioned meetings, and we also do capacity development. So we organize trainings to help uh, improve civil society knowledge on the conventions, the Convention on Corruption and Transnational Organized Crime. And of course, their cooperation with the uh, with the governments in, in the implementation of those two conventions. Uh, another element of our work is uh, that we do advocacy and awareness raising activities with CSOs. Um, you may ask whether we give funding to CSOs. It's very important, right? UNODC as the office does. Um, for example, through the Blue Heart campaign, and um, it's a voluntary trust fund for victims of trafficking in persons. But we as a team, since we play the role of, of more liaison and capacity development, we only give um, small amounts, small grants to CSOs that we train to do some follow-up work on the ground. Um, Elena mentioned that uh, my work focuses thematically on anti-corruption and also an increasing CSO dialogue with governments in this regard. So again, here we have a lot of anti-corruption NGOs or just NGOs that work um, on, on this, say, cross-cutting issue. And uh, it would be very, very difficult to, to work, work with each and every one here too. So we implement activities or projects through partnerships with CSO umbrella networks. You may have heard of Transparency International, very famous one, uh, right? Or uh, the UNCA coalition. The latter is a global CSO umbrella organization that unites over 350 civil society organizations working globally on anti-corruption at different levels. And here I mean grassroots, national, regional, and international level. So it's a very good partner for, for, for UNODC to have. And in fact, UNODC has a memorandum of understanding with this coalition, which uh, lays out our areas of, of, um, of common interest, of cooperation. Um, this MOU pr provides um, a framework for, for our work, for example, what concerns the implementation of activities on the UN Convention Against Corruption and engaging civil society in this very much uh, governmental process. So in terms of activities, what we do, we organize uh, regional trainings on the specifically convention. So this is this unique opportunity where we bring government, civil society, and the private sector all together in one room for a week um, of sessions on the provisions of the convention. And this is really an opportunity for them to frankly discuss the issues, leaving the formalities of, uh, of the Vienna Fora behind. And that's when, um, for example, NGOs for the first time, they meet their uh, respective governmental counterparts and, uh, and engage in a, in, in a dialogue in turn. And uh, subsequently, uh, we see that more and more uh, state parties are willing to choose to work with the civil society in the implementation of this convention. Um, talking figures, uh, we looked at the global statistics out of all the state parties that ratified the convention, 
89% of them in 2015 involved civil society. So the percentage is quite high. We can see that um, quite, quite many member states did that. But today in 2020, the number is even higher. Nearly all of those that ratified the convention, around 98%, um, have had dialogue with the civil society organizations on uh, anti-corruption. So it shows again that civil society organizations are those actors that uh, are important and that they, they are the ones that bring the realities uh, on the ground to the governmental, intra-governmental level. Then um, we work with CSOs on the margins of the key anti-corruption events. Um, there is one uh, very important meeting coming up uh, on the 19th and 20th of November. It is going to be a conference at the state parties meeting on the preparations to the UN General Assembly special session on corruption that will take place next June. So for the first time, the GA will meet to discuss this issue. And uh, now member states are uh, discussing the draft political declaration and civil society organizations have the possibility to follow the meeting as observers and also make statements. Okay. And uh, lastly, in the anti-corruption portfolio, we work with CSOs on awareness raising. Another important date for us is the 9th of December which is the International Anti-Corruption Date. And in the lead up to this, um, UNODC disseminated uh, materials and publications to civil society organizations across the world uh, with focus um, on Africa. And uh, closer to the date, we'll disseminate campaign material as to support civil society advocacy and outreach efforts on the ground. And uh, of course, very importantly, we try to engage CSOs in uh, policy development and anti-corruption programming in their respective countries. And that's where our field offices uh, step in to help us. Um, I would probably sound overly confident if I said that um, the newly nascent uh, um, anti-corruption agency in Uzbekistan is looking to establish uh, a mechanism to cooperate with civil society thanks to our work, or that the Agency for Prevention of Corruption and Coordination of the Fight Against Corruption in Bosnia is sharing draft legislation with CSOs um, thanks to our portfolio. But certainly a big element of our work can be attributed to such achievements. So on this note, uh, I will close my um, intervention and Milena, back to you. So now we can switch on definitely to Alex. Alex Petkov is a, pro uh, Victoria, thank you one more time, of course. Uh, Alex Petkov is a project associate at the Corruption and Economic Crime Branch of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And he works um, on UNODC anti-corruption education initiatives and projects. He's also a PhD candidate in economics um, at the University of National World Economy in Sofia, Bulgaria. He's originally from Bulgaria and prior to joining UNODC, he worked at the International Anti-Corruption Academy and the Bulgarian National Bank. He is, uh, uh, you know, he is, um, basically it's um, quite, a, quite a, a joy element here for me to present exactly Alex Petkov today in the evening. He is, um, uh, basically, it has to be the colleague of him, uh, 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 Sigal Horowitz, but uh, due to some personal issues, she managed to uh, invite Alex. And I'm very happy because Alex, uh, uh, you know, quite a quite a flexible kind of a uh, of a planning, and he was uh, uh, he was confirming his participation. Thank you very much, Alex, for uh, joining us uh, here. And I just have to also to emphasize that I'm very uh, happy you will introduce the Education for Justice initiative, I think mainly, and this is something that I also uh, worked on as one of uh, the experts uh, worldwide who uh, introduced this model. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to have you here, Alex, please. 
Thank you very much, Milena, for the nice introduction and also for the invite. Unfortunately, my colleague Sigal uh, is not able to participate today, but uh, me as a person who is part of the anti-corruption education team of our branch at UNODC, I mostly I work mostly with academics and lecturers and professors from all over the world, but not so often have the opportunity to directly uh, be in touch with students. So I'm pleased to be here. And I also very much looking forward to your questions and the discussion after my short presentation. And in this regard, I very much encourage you to, to pose your questions and I'll be happy to answer them. So uh, let me first share a few slides with you. I hope you hear me well and also that you can see the slides. Yes, it works. Great. So uh, to pick up on a few of Vicky's points, I will uh, talk a little bit more about our work in the context of the UN Convention Against Corruption. As uh, Milena mentioned, I'm part of the Corruption Economic Crime Branch of UNODC that serves as a guardian of this convention. And I will also present you one of our education related projects because this is part of my portfolio and also I believe this will be very interesting to you uh, given the, the audience and the academic environment here and finally I will conclude with a few practical examples of how do we engage civil society organizations from different parts of the world in the course of our project that's called education for justice. So let me get back to the UN Convention Against Corruption that uh, you've heard already a few times uh, by, from Milena and also from Vicky. As I mentioned a few, few minutes ago, uh, UNODC is the criminal justice agency of, uh, of the UN. And our, mo our work is mostly related to various international conventions that deal with different forms of crime. Such a convention is UNCAC, which is up to date uh, the, the only one uh, global, legally binding international treaty that provides uh, its state parties with a comprehensive framework to address the issue of corruption. And what I mean by global is uh, because we have several anti-corruption conventions developed and uh, implemented by various international organizations. Most of them, however, are either regional, for example, the Council of Europe conventions or the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption, or such a conventions that focus on very particular forms of corruption, such as the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development Anti-Bribery Convention that focus on the issue of bribery, but corruption has many different forms. And to that end, UNCAC is the only global convention that covers all regions and tries to be as comprehensive as possible in terms of covering these different forms of corruption. This global character of UNCAC is confirmed by um, the fact that uh, as of today, 187 countries have joined and ratified the convention. Here, actually, you see on the slide that there are 186 because uh, very recently, the last one uh, joined the, um, the state parties. That was the, uh, the kingdom of uh, Togo. Uh, not Togo, uh, excuse me, Tonga. And it was the last country that joined the, the convention. And here um, on this map, you see uh, the coverage of this convention and you can see only a very few red points that are marked which, with which are marked the countries that are not yet part of uh, our convention. And just wanted to ask you something here. Do you have any idea how many uh, member states are part of the United Nations? You can type in the... <clears throat> in the chat if you have if you know the number of uh, un member states 
and I would ask uh, Milena to assist me with the answers because I cannot see the chat now. But any guess or any suggestions? No, till now nothing. <laughs> yes, yes, now we have 195, 96, 193. 193 is the correct answer. So the UN has 193 member states. And out of 193 member states of the UN, 187, as I, may, as I said, have joined uh, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, which again confirms uh, how many countries are engaged with and how many countries are implementing or trying to implement the provisions of this convention. And when I'm talking about the provisions of this convention, it is um, worth mentioning that uh, the convention has four substantive chapters, uh, which are chapter two uh, on preventive measures, chapter three on cr uh, criminal justice and law enforcement, chapter four on international cooperation, and chapter five on asset recoveries. So each of these chapters provide for a very concrete requirements to each state party to this convention with regards to these four topics. So basically, <clears throat> excuse me, each state party which has joined the convention is obliged to implement into its national legislation the provisions on these four topics. And uh, here we also uh, can um, mention the very innovative character of this convention because it was adopted uh, in 2003 and entered into force in 2005. And in 2003, actually, it was the, this convention was the very first uh, international treaty that emphasized the importance of preventive measures, uh, which, is, uh, which are covered in chapter two. And of course, nowadays, everyone, everyone can agree on, and it's very uh, common understanding that uh, preventive measures are as uh, are equally important to the law enforcement measures to fight uh, complicated crimes such as corruption. However, only 15 or 18 years ago, this understanding wasn't so common. So here we also demonstrate that UNCAC is not only a global but also very innovative innovative treaty that aims to help countries to address corruption and. Actually, as part of uh, the preventive measures, we have also Article 13, which requires all state parties to the convention uh, to work with uh, civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations, and other partners, including the academia, which are outside the public and the government sector, in order to involve them and to erase their awareness on issues related to prevention of and fight against corruption. So basically, even under the UNCAC, which is a very legal and a formal um, piece of international law, uh, we have the mandates to work with civil society organizations and to help them in the ways that Vicky mentioned to you. However, um, and also, I must say that uh, talking about UNCAC, our work is mostly related, although we have this um, Article 13 required the requiring the state parties to work with civil societies and other state actors. Uh, our work was mostly related to, in the past few years, like past few years and until recently, uh, with uh, related to strengthening uh, legislations and institutional frameworks of the state parties of the convention. Because that was the focus of all of them from the very early ages, uh, very early years of the convention, most of the state parties were fo uh, focused on strengthening their legislations, institutions, and public sector authorities in order to be able to help uh, to fight corruption. Hence, they required us uh, most often to work with various law enforcement bodies and to help them to strengthen their capacity. However, 
the more we work in this area, the more we realize that good laws and strong institutions alone are not sufficient to fight such a complex phenomenon as corruption. We witness in many countries who have strong institutions, who have good laws, who have all necessary provisions to fight corruption, and we see that they yet face a lot of corruption. Because uh, the eradication of such a crime as corruption requires something more than uh, good laws and strong institutions. It requires also a cultural shift to be seen across the society, including uh, changing the attitudes and behaviors of people towards corruption. And in, we have come to the, to the understanding that without such a cultural shift, we won't be able to help countries to fight corruption effectively. <clears throat> Hence, <clears throat> we started working more in that direction in the past five or six years. And we realized that education is actually one of the very powerful tools to achieve such a cultural shift. Therefore, we started focusing more and more on anti-corruption education projects uh, with the aim to increase uh, people's understanding and awareness at every step of the educational ladder because we believe that through education, we can supplement our efforts to strengthen the law enforcement bodies and hence to be able to achieve corruption-free societies. And in this regard, uh, as I mentioned, we started working on several anti-corruption education initiatives, the biggest one of which is called Education for Justice. It was a result of um, the Doha Declaration, which was adopted at, in 2015 at the UN uh, Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. And this is a very broad uh, initiative that first covers all UNODC mandate areas, and second, covers all levels of education. I probably won't be wrong if I say that's the biggest uh, initiative of UNODC at the moment, which also emphasizes the importance of education to fight various crimes, including corruption, and how, that we consider education very seriously here at UNODC. So through E4J, as we call it in short, we aim to promote crime prevention and rule of law and criminal justice through the development of various age appropriate materials that can help lecturers at different steps of the education to teach the young generation on UNODC related topics. And what I mean by UNODC related topics, these are all our mandate areas, these all different uh, types of crimes that we are trying to help governments to fight, including terrorism, organized crime, cyber crime, human trafficking, uh, wildlife crime, and also corruption. And as I mentioned, uh, we work on different levels of education, hence we develop various age appropriate tools for each of these levels. Starting from primary education, where we focus on promoting basic values such as acceptance, fairness, integrity, uh, trust, etc. So we try to engage the students from their very early age and try to teach them how important it is to share and apply these values in their daily lives. And in order to do this, we also try to develop materials that uh, will bring these issues as close as possible to them. We want these materials to be interesting to the students. So in the different levels, we have different, different types of tools, starting from primary education, where we promote uh, various comic books, videos, fictional characters. Here on this slide, you see our Zorbs. This is a group of fictional characters that um, engage the, um, the young children with um, different, the, the different values that I just mentioned. And we have all kinds of activities around these orbs. If you go to our website, you'll be able to find a whole uh, fun corner with books, with videos, with uh, online games, 
with different also drawing activities and etc that aim to raise the awareness of students on these values then when we go to to the next step we we start develop more concrete um, materials that focus in particular on different issues and we try to again engage the students and be interesting to them by developing different board games for secondary education, online games, uh, different types of comic books. And then finally, when we go to tertiary education, uh, we decided to help teachers to mainstream UNODC topics in their courses. Therefore, we develop uh, educational materials that could be used by teachers to teach on this topic in their already existing courses. And we have developed university module series on each of our mandate areas, including corruption, integrity, and ethics, uh, in order to support lecturers who are interested in these topics to, to basically teach them and to be able to, to raise the awareness and spread this knowledge that we need uh, to, to empower the rule of law and to achieve um, higher crime prevention in countries. And here on this slide, you see, for example, our university module series on integrity and ethics, which consists of 14 modules. Each of them is designed as a three hours class that is very flexible. It can be used by lecturers either as an ethical component to non-ethic course or as a standalone workshop, webinar, or similar type of activity, or even it could be used by lecturers to develop a whole course on this particular topic. Under each of these modules, although they're three hour, designed to be three hours classes, we also provide guidance for lecturers who wish to stretch the module into a full course. Or also lecturers may wish to combine one, two, or even all of the modules into a, a full course or in, on integrity and ethics. <clears throat> so these modules are very flexible and easily adaptable to different disciplinary contexts. And we wish again to first help lecturers, less experienced lecturers who've never taught about um, introducing the issues of integrity and ethics in their classes uh, to start doing so, to start uh, using these modules in various disciplines. And we actually have uh, very good examples of lecturers from different backgrounds who now realize with our help and with the support of the materials that we develop, they do realize the importance of introducing these topics to their courses. In our academic network, we have lecturers uh, from legal disciplines, from economics, from uh, media and journalism, even from uh, engineering uh, disciplines or medical uh, majors. This is a very wide range of uh, lecturers who, who nowadays use these materials after we develop them. And here you also see the second um, university module series that's driven by the very same principle and tries to encourage lecturers to introduce the topic of uh, fighting corruption into their courses. Because at the end of the day, corruption is an issue that affects all areas of the social life of all our activities. You can see corruption in education. You can see corruption in um, business. You can see corruption in private sector. You can see in all areas of the public life. And therefore, uh, students should be aware of this. And therefore, we believe that anti-corruption education should be mainstreamed in uh, university education at large. And that's why we try to work with lecturers and first to provide them with materials that they need to introduce these topics to their courses. Second, to train them how to use these materials and how to take the best out of them. And finally, to try to uh, convince them also to promote this among their peers and in their universities. Because we believe that this is the only way how we can achieve this change that we are trying to, to achieve. 
And that's the only way to, to engage with more people, especially with youth, and to convince them how important is how important these values are, the values of integrity, ethics, uh, justice, etc. And uh, just to provide you an, uh, with an overview of our goals through the Education for Justice, uh, we aim to achieve a few things. First, we want to prepare the students for value-driven actions by uh, uh, having uh, teachers uh, using these materials in their classes. First, we want to encourage the critical thinking of students, and we want to increase their awareness in a way that uh, we want to, them to understand not only what is the right thing to do, but actually how to do it uh, in their day-to-day -day activities. We want to make sure that what they learn in the classroom, they will then apply it uh, when they go out of this classroom. Of course, to, order, to achieve that, we need to keep the students engaged. Therefore, we use uh, very innovative teaching approaches and uh, we uh, try to be also interactive and we suggest a lot of exercises, a lot of video materials, a lot of uh, new technologies that could be used by, uh, by lecturers who wish to teach these modules. And uh, again, this is with the aim to bring these materials closer to the students so that they realize the importance of uh, what the lecturers are teaching them. We also develop teaching guides with additional pedagogical support for lecturers on how to use this, uh, these materials more effectively. Then, uh, as I said, we, we want these materials to be adaptable to different disciplinary, but also to regional context. We are far from the understanding that we can produce a material that's universally applied to all different educational systems or contexts. And therefore, we always encourage the lecturers who, we, who use our materials to also do their homework, to, to go through the material, to the modules, uh, for example, through the anti-corruption modules uh, before they teach them in the class and see if they can contextualize them either by replacing some of the case studies with more relevant case studies from the particular um, country or context or region or to change some of the theoretical frameworks or to update them with local readings, etc. And in this regard, we started uh, several side projects <coughs> that aim to do exactly this, to help lecturers to contextualize our materials so that they can be used by more and more people in different countries. And now we are currently implementing quite a big project that focus on uh, contextualizing these materials in Kenya, Mexico, and Pakistan, for example. So we take our general modules and bring them down to the local context by, as I say, replacing some of the, some of the content there so that uh, it's more understandable for students. <clears throat> And finally, what we actually aim to achieve is to have these materials taught in um, either non-ethics or non-anti-corruption courses, which what I mean here is that if lecturers want to introduce these topics, integrity, ethics, and anti-corruption in their universities, they don't really need to start whole new courses or whole new disciplines. Rather, they can pick few of these modules and integrate them in their already existing courses. Therefore, we apply very simple and non-technical terminology that's user-friendly and could be understandable even by less experienced lecturers, lecturers who have never thought of teaching integrity, ethics, or anti-corruption. And basically that's uh, what we try to achieve and Besides developing the, mod the modules, we also engage with a lot of uh, training activities. We participate in a lot of conferences where we try to raise the awareness about our Education for Justice initiative and our goals. And we try to engage as many lecturers as possible <clears throat> in this program and in this project. And as of today, we have an academic network of more than 1,000 
uh, lecturers and professors and also teachers who use these modules and these materials all over the world. And we are constantly in touch uh, with them uh, in order to understand what works and what doesn't and how we can improve our materials. And of course, we also have to take into account the, um, the current situations and challenges that we face, including also the COVID-19 related crisis. And therefore, we also started developing a lot of online courses for both lecturers or webinars for students so that these materials are really accessible. And here, you probably are already thinking uh, or wondering uh, what this initiative has to deal with civil society or how this actually involves civil society organizations. And first, I want to say that in implementing the Education for Justice, uh, we at the UNODC don't follow our traditional um, top-down approach where we have uh, international experts going to the national governments and tell or authorities and advising them and telling them what to do. Because uh, as I said at the beginning, education is quite new area for us. Hence, we try to draw on the expertise of academics uh, in order to implement all these activities and to develop all these materials I just presented. And all these 28 modules, the both university module series on integrity and ethics and anti-corruption were actually developed by academics from different universities, including Milena was one of the, of the professors who was involved in the development of modules uh, on integrity and ethics. So we really draw on the expertise of academics from all over the world. We had more than 70 <coughs> academics from 35 countries for each of these module series. And here also comes the role of um, the civil societies. Besides academics, we were also in touch with various civil societies uh, who helped us first to develop these modules, these materials by providing um, their expertise and their knowledge to us. They reviewed the materials, they commented on what's good, what's not. They send us some suggestions on content that we should include in these materials. And also uh, we have a very positive experience in working with civil societies on disseminating these materials in different countries. Uh, for instance, I can mention the um, uh, Accountability Lab, which is uh, an American-based uh, civil society organization that works in various countries all over the world who helped us to, to disseminate these modules in Nigeria, in Pakistan, and in many other countries. So this is the first um, flow of cooperation with civil societies that we do under the Education for Justice Initiative. The second one is actually very interesting and it's the example that we give uh, in our materials. Because if you go through the materials, if you go through the modules and read them, you will see a lot of case studies, a lot of videos, a lot of uh, links to projects that are actually projects, videos, or case studies of civil societies. We give a lot of civil societies as an examples of efficient uh, actors in the fight against corruption in all our modules. So we both draw on the expertise and count on the help of the civil societies to help us implement the project, but we also they also serve as role models and good examples and practices uh, when we try to teach uh, students and young on how important it is to fight corruption and how important it is to act with integrity and ethics. And I will stop here. Uh, this was uh, my two cents on working uh, with civil society organizations under our anti-corruption education portfolio. And I will be very happy to answer all your questions. Thank you.